Um, I, I want to just basic, I want to pose this fundamental question. My talk today is about saving cities and building movements. So I want to pose this fundamental question. So what do we need to save cities from, and what do we need movements for? Well, missing a word there. Sorry, guys. Um, and I guess the, the first, to answer the first question is we need to save cities because we're at a fundamental sort of crossroads right now in, the way, in our political economy that has made it clear that the, that the consequences of the situation that we're in or the gravity of the situation we're in can't be ignored anymore. Um, and we have to build new institutions to kind of deal with those challenges in an integrated way. What do we need movements for? We need movements because we're, at the, we're standing on the precipice of some of the greatest moments in, our, in the history of our, of, our re, of our recent history, sorry, in our country. The greatest economic downturn this country's seen in 70 years, the greatest income inequality this nation's seen probably in its history, and uh, let's see, what was the third thing I was going to say? <laughs> Um, the, and finally, sort of, the, not from the, from the bottom to the top, but from the top to the bottom, oh, whoa, the other way around, from the bottom to the top, actually, has created this sort of great need for movements to be sort of built. And what we're seeing in the current context of this Occupy Wall Street phenomenon is that there are actors who are outside of the system who want to get back in. And that's also sort of fueled in with the... Uh, with some recent Supreme Court decisions that put wealth at the center of how setting public policy. So where's my clicker? Click. Oops, no. Yeah. Sorry, that was wrong. Uh, so just by way of quick introduction, PUSH is an organization, a grassroots community organization that's trying to, that attempts to do community organizing as well as as well as grassroots, uh, small-scale, affordable housing development. And in 2007, we brought some folks together to build what was our, our first real neighborhood platform that addressed housing, the environment, economic development, and education uh, at the, at our, from our neighborhood perspective. A year after that, we were, brought, we were sitting around in a room going through campaign development process, and I was facilitating a, a discussion to kind of look at all those issues on the board and figure out which ones we were going to tackle, which ones we had the ability to move. And uh, we had a hard time kind of narrowing down because there were so many great ideas on the board. Well, in a moment of frustration, I got to the point where I was like, hey, guys, listen, we got to move. Which one are we going to pick? And they pushed back on me and said, well, why can't we do them all? I said, okay, cool. You know, let's talk it out. Thinking to myself, once we figured out uh, how much work it was going to take to move one of these, we were going to narrow ourselves down, we were going to come back to reality, right? Well, what ended up happening was they convinced me to take a select few of our priority issues from our larger platform and, work, and move them together because what we ended up discovering was that those issues picked off one at a time was not going to bring the kind of transformative uh, change to the neighborhood that we needed fast enough. Uh, Let's we'll see. So what we're talking about now is facing a bunch of crises, crises at the same time. And what we realized was that we can't just tackle them one at a time. I'm not going to walk through this entire slide with you here, but just suffice it to say that on the outside, what you see are, you know, some class, are the, the priority issues that we decided to tackle first because we thought that we could build institutions around them and then tackle those problems together as a community at the neighborhood level, and that those uh, issues on the outside are basically reflective of the historic challenges that are in the big box on the inside. So we've basically analogized this to symptoms of disease, right? And what we're... What we, when we looked at dealing with these challenges together, we essentially realized that our neighborhoods are living systems and need to be treated like them, right? Uh, and that these systems of, these living systems need to be treated like organisms. And uh, dealing with their challenges was going to be a, a, an, interesting, an interesting fight to do it in an integrated way. So when you feel sick, right, all these historic challenges basically are symptomatic of a sick city. So when you feel sick, you need to go to the doctor, right? Well, not really, because, I mean, who of us young people in the room traditionally don't 
partake in health care because we're deferring health care for a whole bunch of reasons, right? More important stuff to do, right? There's, uh, I got life to live, I got a job, I'm trying to save for, uh, save for my house and that sort of thing. Well, when you are in this sort of cycle of deferment, the diseases that are inside of you aren't taking a break. They're working hard, and, and they work hard until they wipe you out. So when you finally go to the doctor, you're basically, you, go, you get checked out, you get a script from a doctor, you get uh, some pills to take, or if you're not into that, you self-medicate, right? That's basically how it works. And that sounds simple enough. It's a one-in, one-way-in, one-way-out sort of system. And, but unfortunately, what's put the problem is that system is fragmented. It's really, it's, it's a broken system where, you know, there's poor, uh, there are poor outcomes, there's poor coordination between, between patients and physicians, and, they can, and, the ultimate, um, and the ultimate expression of that is when people have bad experiences, they're just not there, right? There are plenty of people who fall outside the margins of our current healthcare delivery system. And thankfully, we're beginning to see that and change it. And the same thing can be said for our cities. So, but with that kind of system, who needs health care? Guess what? Everybody. Everybody needs to be in this in the system. But those poor outcomes that, are, that result from a fragmented system can be addressed by something really simple called a, con a continuum of care. And if with six cities as they stand, right, Who's going to take care of them in a continuum of care kind of idea? Look around, people. All of us, right? What is a continuum of care? Well, it's quickly, it's described on the board right now, but it's essentially an approach that institutions from philanthropic organizations to the Department of Housing and Urban Development use to bring multiple stakeholders to the table to integrate uh, care and intervene in, early, in various stages of disease treatment to plan, uh, to plan, benchmark, and assess treatment at various stages of health to maintain well-being earlier to reduce cost. Now, for us, that continuum of care is really, really simple, right? People are just not in the system, right? Our, our cities right now, our cities right now, are places where people feel disconnected from the current way that we set and deliver urban policy, right? Uh, and that's part of the power of what I think is happening in Wall Street right now. I'm just gonna flash, I'm just gonna flash my whole Banks Accountable t-shirt. We're part of a national affiliation uh, called NPA, the National People's Action, that's down there right now and has been engaged in a movement for a couple of years that we've been a part of to hold banks accountable for the, the disinvestment of cities, right? The structural, the structural, um, manifestation of multiple features and symptoms that give rise to other, other features and conditions is called a syndrome. And right now, our cities suffer from a syndrome of disinvestment uh, in the way that I described in our big priority issues. So indoor and outdoor environmental hazards, vacant spaces, crumbling infrastructure, uh, and lack of, lack of connection to employment are all symptoms of a syndrome of disinvestment. That means uh, we all, as care, <clears throat> as providers of urban policy, as caregivers to our urban, our urban uh, core, as residents, and ultimately uh, as a, the larger patient of the city is concerned, we need to be brought into a continuum of care where we can intervene earlier in the, co the compounding crises that cities face. Well, what's that got to do with organizing? Right? It's a good question. It's a great question. At PUSH, we see it as a revolving cycle, right? Community organizing fuels development, and development success fuels organizing. We start out from the, from the basic premise that if we identify people who are excited about, uh, who are excited about social change in their neighborhood, and can run winning campaigns, we're gonna bring more resources into our neighborhood to do the kind of development that we, uh, we're hoping will address the challenges, our big ticket challenges in our neighborhood, and ultimately do that in a democratic way where residents are setting the table for our development work and evaluating it along our core values. And this is what it looks like. 
our, you know, when we put this, the broader part of our platform together, this is what it looks like. Where in the center, it's a revolving wheel of our values. In the middle there, with the arrows kind of pointing out, our strategies and approaches that we're thinking about using. And ultimately, that yellow ring is what we get when we act in a coordinated way in a continuum of care a philosophy where we hold banks accountable, for example, for the, lack of for the lack of investment and the wealth extraction they've done over the years from our neighborhoods, where we're partnering with other groups like the Massachusetts Avenue Project to provide uh, healthy food to folks and rebuild those pieces of the public infrastructure that connect people to their own personal health and well-being. And then ultimately, we're uh, influencing public policy with our friends at NPA to uh, change the table on how we invest in cities. Well, who else is thinking that way right now? We're not alone. There's no, nothing new under the sun. There's, no, there's no, uh, nothing that hasn't been invented yet, as the old saying goes. Lancaster, Lancaster, California is using this continuum care of care philosophy to actually not just deal with the way it's, uh, they handle homelessness prevention, but ultimately how they're uh, extending homelessness prevention to the broader notion of re rebuilding neighborhood fabric and reintegrating folks who've been uh, chronically homeless for a long time. Other places like the Living Cities Project, which you might be familiar with, are taking you know, what we call, what some people call venture philanthropy and using this in the same way to think about integrated approaches to rebuilding cities like Newark, New Jersey. And ultimately there's some promising sort of uh, early signs that this is happening at the federal level through things like the Sustainable Communities Initiative, which is a partnership between the EPA, the DOT, and HUD to make sure that there were just regional planning grants and were sent out to do this in a more integrated way. But it doesn't go far enough to bring people like me into the fold, right? CBOs, grassroots organizations, and regular people who were part of that continuum of care need to be brought in too. Well, what can we possibly do about that? It's real easy. Glad you asked. Um, <laughs> We can start movement building, right? And movement building is really simple. In the beginning, I'll use affordable house, housing as an example. And we start from the back and work our way to the little dots in the, in the beginning, on the left. Movement building and affordable housing is, is essentially this. Using our, our capacity to meet unmet needs in, our, in the places where we work, bringing, those, bringing folks in uh, to do consciousness building to broaden the scale and scope of our work to build more, right? To, in, to invest them in collective action because we can't solve these problems by ourselves. And ultimately doing leadership development with those folks who are affected by, those, by critical unmet needs like affordable housing or access to affordable housing so that uh, we can scale up and broaden the work that happens at the neighborhood level to the state and to the federal level. Now, just zoom that into one of those little dots. Just think of that as a molecule of what I've talked about now. And the left, the dots on the left are multiple movements, right? The affordable housing movement, the uh, prison rights movement, or uh, the marriage equality movement are all movements. And in a bigger sense, right, the, move, the movement on the right for social justice as a whole can be, can be thought of as in the same way where <clears throat> Those groups, although seemingly random and disparate, are bound together by, by philosophy and ideology of access to being brought into access to decision making at the fundamental level of how it directly affects us. And what now, what those movements rise from is the fact that there's, the interventions in their movements are so late, right? Affordable housing is so uh, disconnected and broken right now that we've got, you know, the, the uh, movement, multiple movements to, the, to save public housing, uh, to save housing vouchers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so when we're talking about binding those movements together in a more cohesive way, their message has to turn into structured demands, and their protest has to turn into deeper forms of resistance that uh, crack open the, 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 the closeness, the closeness of the system so that we can ultimately have more democratic solutions. And that's what I think is really powerful about what's happening on Wall Street right now and what's beginning to happen across the country is that movement spreads because we're recognizing, right? We're recognizing the deep connectivity of those multiple movements at the local level and at the national level. So what do we get? What do we want? What do we do? And what do we get? Well, first, we have to recognize that there's a syndrome going on, right? We're to recognize that the multiple sy the symptoms of what we're facing in cities isn't just 
a one-off here or a one-off problem here, but they're part of a, of a condition that needs to be uh, dealt with in a more integrated and a systematic way. We need to bring movements together, right? And the way that I described a little, just, a, just a second ago and what's in the way that's happening now, we need to bring movements together so that we can begin to share practice and that we can recognize and fundamentally affirm that people know what they need where they live, that those people are policymakers, and that ultimately they deserve seats at the decision-making table. So that policy begins the begins to set the table for new forms of governance structures and ultimately projects that we can act on the ground on the ground here, but also demonstrate and scale up at the broader national level. And if we do that, we get holistic approaches. Holistic approaches to dealing with the problems of cities, dealing with the problems of, of, of specialized populations who are on the margins right now, who opt out of what we broadly call civic engagement, or what we call, you know, being involved in our cities because they just don't feel in. And it ultimately gives us the opportunity to, give, to derive innovative solutions to this problem through a continuum of care where multiple actors are in together and they're planning, again, planning, benchmarking, and assessing their performance in the way we treat the syndromes and conditions of cities. And that gives us, all, at, the, at the end of it, a national framework. So I'm going to call for, I'm calling for this idea right now of, of designation areas where six cities like Buffalo, like Detroit, like St. Louis, and many others across this country uh, work with the federal government to, to recognize the syndromes that they're facing and deal with them holistically, bring new actors into the situation, deepen and broaden in the, de in the democratic, in the fundamentally democratic way that we believe in as a country to change our delivery system of, of, of urban policy. Because when we reintegrate marginalized actors into, that situ in, into the decision making, we reweave the fabric uh, of city building, and that changes the perceptions, the functionality, and the reality of our cities. So I want you to join me in that call and that battle of big ideas, because it's really easy. I just did it. Uh, <laughs> um, and thank you guys for your time.